Good morning, everyone. So we have four topics on today's agenda. Uh, we will go through the initiation of Netlink uh, and the US Weekly, the U-Curve Inversion and the Philip Singapore Weekly. So a bit of the company background, uh, Netlink Trust designs, builds, owns and operates the passive fiber network infrastructure in Singapore. It owns extensive uh, assets with regards to the network infrastructure. Uh, they own about 16,000 km of ducts, 62,000 manholes, and 76,000 km of fibers, and 33,000 square meters of co-location space. We'll later run through the investment thesis. So the demands for fiber is of course, number one, the increased data consumption. Uh, number two, the growth in market size. For example, the increase in Singapore's uh, population. Number three is the migration from older technologies to fiber. So right now in Singapore, we have three technologies, which is the HFC, ADSL, and fiber. Uh, in Singapore now, we are 98% fiberly connected. Uh, this is the residential space. So the remaining 2% is still using the older technologies. So uh, this 2% will convert into fiber uh, estimated in 2020. The other driver for uh, fiber will be government initiatives, which we will go through later. So in figure one, we can observe the industry structure. Uh, the, over here is the consumer and users. Uh, Below that is the retail service, service providers, which is your telcos, uh, Starhub and Singtel. And below that is the active infrastructure companies, which uh, designs, builds the active infrastructure, which is uh, switch and routers that transmits your Wi-Fi uh, wi signal. And at, over at the bottom is where Netlink is. They own and deploy uh, fiber optics and fulfill Singapore's uh, connectivity. So before we move on to the revenue, uh, we have to understand the regulated pricing. So uh, Netlink is essentially a monopoly in the residential space. So to ensure uh, fair pricing to the masses and for Netlink to get uh, a meaningful re return on its investments, IMDA, the regulator, have come about this regulated asset base. They have uh, allowed Netlink to recover cost components, which uh, includes depreciation operating expenditure and the return on capital employed. This is based on the pre-tax spec of 7%, which is set by the CAPM model. Uh, IMDA may change this uh, every five years in reviews, and IMDA may also conduct midterm adjustments after the third year. So in figure two, these prices have already incorporated the uh, recovery of this cost component and for Netlink to make 7%. So Netlink will be able to generate alpha if uh, they uh they meet higher expected higher than expected connections in the residential space or non-residential space. So for the revenue is basically from fiber business and non-fiber business. Uh, residential is uh, under the red model. Uh, residential commands sixty percent of revenue. It supports uh one point three million end users. Is the sole network provider for uh, the country. This is the core of uh, Netlink's revenue. It's stable and recurring. Uh, in long term, it's packed to population growth and also uh, the possibility of dual connections per household. Uh, we projected 11.5% year on year growth for to 1.43 million uh, connections by FY20E. The next segment will be the non-residential, uh, which is also under the red, red model. Uh, it supports 45,000 connections. So in this space, uh, they are competing with RSPs like Singtel and Starhub, where the RSPs have their own fiber infrastructure in the CBD areas. Growth will stem from government initiatives like the Fiber Ready Scheme, where the government incentivizes uh, small businesses to go digital and hence uh, require the use of fiber. We project a more conservative 5.3% growth year on year to 48,000 connections by FY20.
next will be the non-building address points, NBAP. Uh, it supports 1, 000, about 1,500 connections. We expect the growth coming from uh, government initiatives and smart nation initiatives. In figure five, you can observe there are three uh, running smart nation initiatives currently. Uh, an example would be LTA where, uh, sorry, so, so MBAP connections are connections without a physical uh, address or postal code. So uh, it may be a smart lamp uh, or billboard signage. So in the case where LTA wants to uh, monitor traffic, uh, fiber connection is needed to collect real-time data. So there'll be a growth in this uh, segment uh, as the progressive rollout of Smart Nation initiative uh, runs. So we project a 41% growth year on year to 2,000 connections by FY20E. So uh, MBAP connections can also be built to sense the weather uh, along the streets as well. So this is an example of the MBAP connections. And these are the manholes and ducts that Netlink uh, owns as well in relation to the fiber connection. So moving on, uh, installation revenue. So installation revenue is basically new uh, connections into the residential, non-residential and MBAP connections. It mainly comprises of one-time installation charges, uh, as you can see in figure seven. On top of that, there is also a new service activation charge of $53 and $64 for the residential and non-residential. So this revenue will closely track the uh, increase in connections in the uh, different uh, residential, non-residential and, and bad. So for diversion revenue, this is non-rep. Uh, basically, it's NLT's assets. Uh, if NLT's assets is in the way of like constructions for new buildings, property developers, or LTA, NL, uh, Netlink will have to divert their ducts and manholes for this construction. This is uh, pretty ad hoc in, in nature and uh, very hard to predict. Uh, moving on to co-location, this is basically a rental income from uh, leasing central officer space. Uh, growth will be packed overall to end user fiber. Uh, next is the non-fiber business. It's mainly from Singtel, the legacy business. Uh, so ducks and manholes, sales occurs when uh, third party like Singtel uses the duck and manholes for their own business. Expect this to be stable over the long run. Uh, and next will be central offices where this is mainly Singtel uh, leasing space from uh, Netlink Trust. So you can see the most of the revenue is uh, pretty fragmented. Uh, I would like to reiterate that the residential remains the uh, core business of Netlink and is stable and recurring in nature. So moving on to expenses with Netlink's uh, $3 billion of assets, uh, it's no doubt that depreciation and amortization will be the largest expense item in uh, the income statement. So Netlink uses the straight line depreciation. Uh, ducks and manholes is at 35 years and fibers at 25 years useful life. Uh, there's also the amortization of license fees that totals 10 million per annum using the straight line method over 23 years. So overall, there will not be any impact on distributions as these are non-cash in nature. We will not be going through the rest of the expense item as it's pretty straightforward, like staff costs and finance costs or management fee. Uh, Netlink pays a management fee of $900,000 a year to the trust. So Netlink is uh, qualified for this uh, QPDS, which is basically a loan from trust to trustee. Uh, this loan is $1.1 billion uh, and it's at 10.5 uh, fixed interest rate. So Netlink will be able to save from uh, tax expense and the income received will also be tax exempted. These tax savings will contribute to higher uh, distributions to, to the unit holders. Moving on to distribution, uh, they have a distribution policy of uh, distributing at least 90% of uh, its income. The trust will distribute 100% of its cash available for distribution. We forecasted a $180 million 
CFD to unit holders in 19, uh, FY19E. Uh, this is a distribution yield of 5.7% of uh, 0 0.83 cents. So the risk factors, uh, number one is revenue volatility. Uh, this point is not saying that uh, Netlink trust revenue is volatile. We're saying that if there's volatility, uh, it will come from this uh, diversion revenue and non-residential as non-residential has uh, competition with the RSPs. Uh, installation revenue also tracks close to non-residential so uh, there may be some variability over there. Uh, the change in ICO uh, which will affect Netlink's profitability would also affect uh, the distribution. Uh, failing to meet the quality of service standards also will uh, entail a fine to Netlink Trust, and also unforeseen capex would impact uh, Netlink's profitability as well. So uh, it will affect Netlink's uh, cash available for distribution. So to sum up uh, our investment thesis, number one is the uh, sole network provider for the residential broadband in Singapore. Uh, it's because of the stable and predictable revenue stream, it's counter cyclical uh, and there's future growth for, from embed and non-residential connections. So with that, we have, uh, we use the DCF approach in our valuation because of the regular stream of cash from its fiber business. Uh, our val valuation is based on a back of 6% and a terminal growth rate of 1%. So with that, we have a target price of 89 cents and last time was 0.83. So we pass it on to Edmund who will talk about US Weekly. Hi, thank you, Alvin. So right now I'll cover the US Weekly. So for the macro last week, um, the private housing stocks were less than expected and the single family home building is down by 1.7% which shows that the overall housing market is still pretty weak. As for the University of Michigan's uh, Consumer Sentiment Index, it improved to 98.4 from a previous 93.8, and it beat the consensus of 97.8, but it is still in relatively weak, uh, weak range. As for the uh, trade deficit, uh, the US trade deficit uh, improved so the exports rose about 1% month over month in January, and about half of which was due to an increase in the soybeans as the shipments to China has resumed. As for imports, it fell by 2.6%, and most of that comes from computers and semiconductors. So for the week ahead, some of the key indicators to be released will be the retail sales month over month, the ISM manufacturing PMI, the durable goods orders, and the non-farm payroll. So this is the list of the upcoming earnings release. So most of the banks will be releasing their results, their Q1 results near, near mid-April. Okay, so as a lot of people are getting worried about the U-curve inversion. So I'll talk a bit about it. So firstly, um, as you can see from the graph, which is the 10-year, three-month yield spread versus the S&P 500, you can see that for the past three recessions, the market still rallies after the very first inversion. So there's an average upside of about 28% and 32% after the inversion of the three-month 10-year use spread and the two-year 10-year use spread, respectively. And the rally will last for at least uh, 14 months before the market downturn and the recession. We believe that a recession is um, unlikely for this year because we calculated the duration between the first, first inversion and the time to the recession. So on average, it took about 22 months after the first inversion of the three month 10 year before a recession occur. And there are at least four instances of the inversion of the U curve before the actual recession. So we will expect that um, after this particular inversion, there are at least three more before um, 
the, there will be a market, market downturn. So in the worst case scenario, we expect the recession to only occur in Q1 2020. So we have a list of 17 Philip recession indicators. And as you can see, 16 or 17 of them are pretty healthy. Another indicator would be the corporate credit spread. So the corporate credit spread is currently at historical low levels and is far below that during the global financial crisis. So as the two year, 10 year use spread has yet to invert and our Philip recession indicators are all showing pretty healthy figures, we will need more triggers and more indications before we, we see a imminent recession. And with the Fed signaling that there's going to be no rate hikes for this year, and the balance sheet runoff to end in September, which means that they are likely to restart their QE program uh, the earliest by uh, Q4 2018, uh, 2019. So we will see that um, although there's an inversion, it is uh, not likely for us to have a recession this year. So right now, I'll pass on my time to Paul to we'll talk more about the Singapore Weekly. Uh, hi, hi. Uh, th thanks, Edmund. Uh, just, uh, okay, yeah, I'll continue. Just uh, our usual weekly updates on for Singapore market, uh, week 14. Uh, okay, in, in terms of the macro that has been that has been released so far, uh, it's, it, um, it's still still pretty soft for, for, for Singapore. And uh, likewise, also for, for the U.S., uh, the only some of the pickup that we see that in terms of the macro, as you know, that the whole market now looking for signs of a global recovery. Uh, so far, the two some of the two numbers that have, that have improved is of course the German IFO survey. It's a kind of a PMI survey, uh, and also the other pickup has been as you can see the March uh, the PMI from from China is also up. It's the high it's the highest in in six months. So there are sign tentative signs of a pickup in global economies. Uh, in terms of our views, uh, uh, okay, anyway, I'll just move on to this chart. As you can see, um, in Japan, things are still uh, like, uh, are still flattish and also the import values out of the US is also down, so it's still weak. But the one that has picked up a lot is actually the German IFO. Okay, anyway, I'll move on to our views is that uh, in terms of REITs, we are turning a bit more cautious. I think in, in general, because um, interest rates are still rising in Singapore and, and actually the market is at least the fixed income market is pricing in a, a, a cut in actually in the US Fed rate. Uh, as you can see from this chart, the, I think the interest, the interest rate expectations now is a, I think is a bit too too dovish. I think what's happening, the rate line is basically the, the Fed rate and it, uh, the expectations for December federal, uh, Fed funds rate is, was actually always been above the Fed run, the, the current Fed rate. But in from the latest data, actually the market's expecting a, a, a cut in the federal funds rate. As you can see, the, the current Fed rate is now about 2.5. So actually, the market is looking about 2.1. So they're looking for at least a 25 basis point cut uh, in the Fed funds rate, which I we think is a bit too dovish. For, uh, yeah. So anyway, that's why we think that a bit more cautious in, uh, for REITs because actually interest rates in Singapore are actually rising and also the global, the global team of cut, lowering rates is, I think, a bit too dovish. So in terms of our tactical views, uh, we thought that, expect that to be some pause in the rally, but... Uh, we, we think that the market fixed income markets, uh, what has happened is that they're beginning to price in a recession as reflected by the yield curve and, and uh, of course by the by expectations of a cut in the federal funds rate. But we are still positive on the, on the equities market. Uh, there are two main reasons for this. Uh, of course, our base case is that there's going to be a trade compromise between the US and China. Uh, as you can see, there's still very positive comments from both sides uh, that the, the, the trade talks are progressing. And the Vice Premier Liu He is actually in Washington now, so you could probably get more sound sound bites from the the trade talks the, this week. That could, would also be supportive for the market. And of course, we still we are of the view that the global growth will recover. I think one the reasons why we we say that is uh, because of course the downturn has been quite protracted, but more importantly, I think the monetary and fiscal easing has only start just started. As you know. Uh, interest rates only begin, the expectations of lower interest rates only begin early this year. So you need time for this to digest, or at least the pause in, in, in raising rates. And the other thing is, as you know, out of China, there's been fiscal easing. Again, all this takes time to flow into the global data numbers. So that's why we think that as global data 
picks up the the, the uh, equity markets will, will rally back again. So that's our uh, expectations for the market. Um, and then just last point, these are some of the key events. I think a lot of manufacturing PM, PMIs will be coming out. So that will be some of the key. And of course, we've got the Indonesian uh, elections. Okay, uh, and there's some rumor that uh, end April that this whole trade deal would be resolved. But again, this is just a rumor. Uh, some there were some comments out there. Okay, uh, uh, and now uh, anyway, uh, that for our last chart, this is uh, as you know we have an absolute ten. This is our so-called model portfolio uh, for 2019. But we will make changes every quarter or even monthly if necessary. Uh, so so far this year, as you know, REITs have been the, the as you look at this portfolio. Uh, REITs have been the one that has outperformed this year for us. I think most of the REITs have done very well, 13-14%. Uh, uh, only some of the global growth stocks that have been, some of the growth names have been a bit uh, uh, weaker. So for this year, we're up about 7%. Um, now, uh, most of the gains actually came in January. I think likewise for the STI. So, but do expect some changes. As you can see, some of them, the they already met our target prices. So we need to to... To change, we'll do a, a next week. We'll probably just announce some of the changes we'll make for this portfolio because some of them have already met our target price, and obviously you can buy something where you have a negative return. So anyway, we'll make some changes on that. Okay. Uh, anyway, thanks, thanks everyone. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, post them. Thank you. Hey, there's a question on Netlink. Uh, amortization and depreciation regarding amortization and depreciation. So. What happens after a number of years when the valuation of the asset reaches zero due to amortization depreciation? So I'll move on to that slide. Hold on. So uh, for the ducks and manholes, uh, Useful life is 35 years and 25 years. Book value will dip, uh, will go down, uh, reach towards zero. But however, Netlink can still use the asset. Uh, the asset will last for roughly 50 over years. So this is for the depreciation only. Uh, just, just remember, this is not a BOT, build, operate and transfer. So Netlink actually owns these assets. And there's a question on um, the UK inversion. So our chart is based on weekly figures and we count uh, the weekly inversion as one occurrence. So on average uh, for the past few recessions, usually there are four instances. So what, what I meant by four instances is that uh, there are four, uh, there are at least for each of the, inversion, there's at least a week of inversion. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, we've got another question. Thanks for your question. Uh, may I ask why is Sing Siong share price year to date underperforming the STI? Has the fundamental change? Um, I, I think what has happened is that uh, because they have, okay, there are two things out there. Um, Okay, um, because when I mean, the recent results came out, uh, what has happened is that the re results was not as 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 good as people expected, uh, partly because uh, as you know they went and un they undergone a massive uh they, they undergone a, a massive growth last year they opened up ten stores the highest that they ever done, so that's why there was some drag on the operating expenses. So that's the one thing. So uh the the stock will probably rebound back once the let's say the first or second quarter the earnings start to reflect the growth in the new stores because so far you see growth in the gross margins but not in the net profit because of the higher operating expenses uh the, the other quest okay the other issue actually there are three issues uh, the other issue is also uh the market is also quite uh, worried about the whole uh, uh consumer spending uh because consumer spending has been has been quite weak, uh, especially in the supermarkets. So market is also a bit hesitant on whether consumer spending uh, for supermarkets will be worse than, than expected. And the, and the third, third reason is also, there's also some worry of their ability to, to, to open uh, new stores. Uh, and that we're not, not so concerned. I think they've recently won one or two bits, I think. And, and for us, the consumer part, of course, for us, it's also like we mentioned in the report, that one's a bit... No, that's more of a macro thing, uh, a macro story. But 
we think that even if the consumer uh, spending on supermarkets is not as good as expectations, the, the new store growth, like which is, I think the space is up almost 40% that, that can actually help the uh, sales in, in general. So th those are the three overhangs of the consumer spending, ability to open new stores and also the, the weaker than expected results. Huh? Or maybe the, the results didn't, didn't beat expectations. Yeah, thanks. Are there any more questions? If not, we will end the webinar in about a minute's time. Thanks. If there's no further questions, we'll end today's webinar. Thank you. See you next week.